So let's start this afternoon session, which we'll have two seminars. The first one is by Diego Blas from Barcelona, please. Okay, thank you. Well, indeed, we have three seminars. You, you didn't know, but there is another one here. <laughs> so because when, I, when they told me to talk about, uh, they suggested that that could be interesting to discuss a couple of topics. Uh, the most of the seminar will be about these recent results, but since uh, my co-authors of other work that appear recently are here, and none of us was talking about the other work. <laughs> if there is time at the end, I will mention the other idea. And I hope they are both in the sense of opening new, new, new ways to to detect new physics with astrophysics, which was the idea that uh, of this week, right? So uh, it's more like a discussion uh, of new topics. So this this first part is talk on is based sorry on work with Alex Jenkins who is now a postdoc at UCL, and the the main idea uh, is in this uh, artistic impression of the effect, which is the the fact that you have a binary system a binary uh, a system of um, let's say two stars the Earth and a satellite or whatever, and if there is a background of gravity waves the uh, process of absorption and emission is one that eventually may make the system uh, resonate with the background and heat up or cool. And this is something that you can try to use to uh, find uh, backgrounds in the frequency range of these guys. All right, that's the that's the idea. So the other talk is going to be on rural clusters and how. Well, that, again, I wanted to mention this because this is a kind of mystery out there. I think in the searches of dark matter, having in mind which are the different anomalies is always good to understand uh, how we can use them to either learn more about astrophysics or about uh, dark matter properties. And one of the mysteries you want to talk to that is out there is that there is a, a globular um, galaxy for Nax. I will talk more about it. And it has some globular clusters or some kind of uh, just floating around that friction with the medium should have already fallen to the center, but they are still there. So is this, is this telling us that the halo of dark matter is a bit different or is it just a statistical fluke or what? Right? So yeah, if you don't have time to discuss this, well, the experts are. <laughs> so uh, I think it's a good topic also for discussion later on. Cool. So let's go back to this one. Uh, yeah. By the way, I just moved to Barcelona uh, in in July, and yeah, it's great to be to be back. So the the first part of the talk is uh, is having to do with gravity waves and using them to learn about uh, new uh, physics. So uh, well, this is a very simple classification of, of gravitational waves, right? Based on whether they are transient, so that they happen once and that's it. They are persistent. Uh, they have some phase that you can use for kind of resonate, or they, they are, well, both um, persistent and random in the sense that the, you have many waves all interacting together. Well, not interacting, overlapping. They are going to, in principle, generate a background which, are, which is there, but has no phase. So this is the kind of background that I'm going to discuss in this first part of the talk, or well, in this talk. Uh, what I'm going to present may also work for other backgrounds where you have a frequency out there, but then it will be a kind of resonant line instead of a, a more broadband um, search. So because I I'm going to have a system with a frequency, which is given to me by astrophysics, so I cannot really tune it. So I, the, the best way to use it is in a stochastic background, because the, this is a kind of reservoir of all the frequencies you want. <laughs> Are strong enough, but in, in a sense, what we are saying is that there are different sources, and uh, you know that you have so many of them that, you know, in the end, all those are not a foreground because you cannot really distinguish them, but they really a background coming to you, and overlapping uh, in your detector in the system that you are using to to look for gravity waves. So it's incoherent, right? Because different sources emit whenever they want. Uh, I use this idea that you cannot resolve them, so it's a it's a background with certain uh, stochastic properties, and uh, well, again, I'm going to assume that they come from 
astrophysical or even cosmological origin. The kind of frequencies we are going to explore uh, for this uh, for this talk are more on the cosmological side, but also for higher frequencies like uh, LIGO, uh, Virgo, and so on. Yeah, there are also astrophysical bands that eventually may be stochastic. Like how many gravity waves on, on average are produced by supernova or these kind of things. In this case, the, the, the parameter that is uh, basically the, the you want to plot, that you want to, to, to look for, is the uh, density parameter, so which is basically the energy density, gravity waves, unit, um, well, normalized properly, but per unit frequency. And this, uh, the, the, the observable that is kind of uh, telling you the um, power that you have at, for which kind of events. And this is what we are. Talking. So it's great. We are great hunters of waves, but uh, you plot them in a as a spectrum. Uh, we are exploring two very different regimes. Those are uh, what they are called power integrated spectra. So basically, you assume that at each of these points you have a spectrum of gravity waves, which is not too crazy, and that's the the constraints that you you get for the different amplitudes. Okay, as a as a, as a function of frequency. We have pulsar time arrays, all right, which are exploring a nano nanohertz frequencies. You may have heard of the nanograph experiment. That's something nano uh, frequencies, and the idea is that the, between pulsars and uh, your radio telescopes, gravity waves go in, in the middle and kind of um, change the 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 signal as, as they go through, and that's why you you can have these kind of sensitivities here. Uh, this is LIGO Virgo that so far has not detected any stochastic background. So LIGO Virgo has uh, only um, merging uh, objects, but again, it's a search that is going on and eventually, you know, who knows whether they will uh, manage to see any background there, but so far only constraints. So those are the two famous uh, observatories that I guess most of you know about. There are other more fun stuff in the middle. They are not so famous because they, <laughs> there is a gap, right, in sensitivity of uh, what you can reach uh, with these dedicated observatories as compared to other other things. This uh, purple line is Cassini. So Cassini, the Cassini satellite or space spacecraft is uh, traveling in the solar system. Uh, travel solar system, you can track its orbit quite and the kind of motion, the, the effect of having a stochastic background would change the orbit to the level that, well, it's computed I don't put references, but they are in the paper to the level that they, I mean, it's not a good, super strong constraint, but you know, there is nothing better in this frequency. So far is, is great. Uh, there is also uh, other kind of constraints. And by the way, have a look at the frequencies. You see that as you are going smaller on a scale, you are also going higher in frequencies. So if you go smaller than Cassini, you, you start seeing planets and the, bound is this uh, yellow line. It is the fact that the gravitational waves hit the Earth and the Earth absorbs some of them. So uh, you can compute the vibration uh, of the Earth due to gravity wave coming in. And yeah, again, you are at the frequencies having to do with the typical uh, normal modes of the Earth. It's not so impressive. The uh, main goal for well, I would say it's biased reasons in this in this game is to beat an effective. So the, the fact that uh, you have extra gravity waves in the universe uh, is gonna change the, his, the cosmic evolution. And if you assume that they were produced, uh, let's say before BBM or by BBM, and uh, they have a very flat spectrum, right? Then the ineffective um, constraints give you a line here. But this line, as I say, is a bit, uh, I would say old fashioned in the in the look in the search for gravity waves because it's an integrated constraint. You're assuming our spectrum, which is almost flat. So if you have a peak which is reaching up here, then you have to compute this bound, right? Because uh, the, the important that you know the spectrum. So it's model dependent. These are, those are more model independent. We are, uh, you see, there is a, a huge gap that is what, yeah. This is LIGO today. 
Sorry? So maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that the, at the moment, uh, LIGO is equivalent to unexpected. Study here seems more constraining. Yeah, but well, like maybe we made a mistake with this, but <laughs> oh, I did say more. Yeah, check. Well, because they are, they, this is the advanced LIGO thingy. So this is the, what is the gravity wave search gonna look in the, in well, 13 years, hopefully, who knows? So there is, there's gonna be a, a, a quite uh, advanced in sensitivity, uh, low frequencies. This is because the number of pulses is gonna be better, uh, higher from the observations, the, the way you time them, the way you do that analysis. So that's what they claim is gonna happen. In the uh, LIGO Virgo, um, well, kind of detectors, the ET, if it happens, maybe it happens by this time already. So who knows? Uh, that's what they claim they can reach. The main uh, game changer is Lisa, right? That hits uh, the middle band between them. And there are other proposals, both in the US and in, in well, in particular in the UK, but in Europe. <laughs> Uh, that uh, want to 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 explore this band between LISA and LIGO and well one of them is ION or MAGIS in the US and this is basically having a one kilometer uh, baseline um, um, experiment with two atom interferometers and you see what happens with gravity waves in between again who knows where this is gonna happen well I, I, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that by 2034 it won't be there but yeah do they have enough funding? Who knows? And uh, again, in this in this game, there is a gap that has not been filled, so at least not to the level. Oh, by the way, that's ineffective with S4 SMB um, observations. And there is this gap here, which is clearly the next goal of you want to fill a gap here. There is also high energy gravity waves. There's a workshop going on on parallel to this one on this precisely now. But uh, the problem with high energy gravity waves is that they are harder to produce at quantity at, at high levels. But here, uh, something that is between PTA and, um, and LISA is certainly filled by models, as I will show later on. So it's a, a gap that you have to have in mind. The strategy is relatively clear. So frequencies of years, right? Well, 10 to 6 seconds or days, years, uh, or length, something between PTA uh, millions of kilometers of LISA. So what can you have here, which is precise enough to see the gravitational waves that's the, or that is slow enough to, to resonate with gravity waves at these frequencies, right? That's what you have to find. And in this case, uh, you can look at um, orbital uh, motion, all right? And uh, in particular of systems like the Earth moon or the binary systems. Uh, the good thing about binary systems is that you have many of them, so you can feel different frequencies. The good thing about the Earth Moon is that you have uh, a very, very good tracking of the of the Moon. Of course, you are not going to see the gravity wave at each uh, you know um, time that the laser goes up and down, but on average, after it goes right, it, you may affect the orbit good enough to to to, to see a signal. So if you have a background of gravitational waves, as I said, at frequencies which are n over the period of the, of the wave, then there is a resonance. And then that means that the, 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 there's going to be a secular evolution. So this background is really accumulating uh, as time goes. That's why uh, if, you, if you wait enough time, the, the initial period is going to change because, the, for instance, the initial orbital uh, dynamics is going to change because you have all these orbits hitting you up. Okay, right. So this is the kind of observations that you're gonna make. You're gonna use the orbital uh, parameters. So there are six orbital parameters um, in Newtonian dynamics and they are gonna be constant in Newtonian dynamics as long as you start modifying the orbit because of anything, a third planet, uh, uh, because the, you don't have exactly Newtonian dynamics or because, you know, uh, uh, what's the name? the fact that, that your uh, source is not exactly spherical. Anyways, all these uh, six uh, elements are going to be modified and time dependent. The most known ones are, of course, the period of the orbit and the eccentricity, which are basically you take the orbit, you put them in front of you, right? And that is, is telling you the shape of the orbit. Uh, but there are uh, four more having to do 
with how the fluid is oriented in a space, but once you fix a, ref a reference frame, the disorientation changes. Like for instance, the inclination is you have a reference um, plane, and with uh, the, the inclination is how this orbit is in this plane. The ascending mode is how do you orient it in this direction, and then uh, the pericenter is how do you orient it in this direction. And yeah, I don't know if people can see me. <laughs> And the, finally, this number is where, at which point do you, did you start tracking the orbit? Those are the six parameters that uh, in uh, Newtonian dynamics, two bodies are constant. And then, for instance, when you want to do GR test, you know that you have to look for the anomalies in the pericenter, right? You can compute it. Uh, but there, are, I mean, the other parameters are also modified. And in principle, the, the, there are many different. Um, yeah, so it's effects that can modify them. The question is how do gravity waves modify them? Of course, this is a, a, a kind of a problem that people thought about at least the 50 years ago. We, we can find in the uh, Misner Thoner Wheeler uh, already a reference to this possibility that uh, a gravity wave, as it passes through two free falling bodies, is going to modify the orbit. But they were quite pessimistic at that time. Think that you would never be able to see this thing, right? As happened with gravity waves in general. <laughs> People were a bit uh, skeptical whether you would ever see them. There was a revival, that, that's what I learned about this uh, from Lam Hui and other people, where they started to, yeah, these people didn't know about binary pulsars, right? That are one of the most precise uh, binary trackers. So Lam Hui et al. already put in some numbers for binary pulsars. We had a similar idea for uh, the influence of um, ultralight dark matter as it fluctuates in the orbital motion with the uh, Sibiriakov uh, Lopez Nasir uh, back uh, for, for years. And yeah, that all this motivated to have a look at this with more like modern technology. All right. Uh, luckily for me, uh, uh, Alex Jenkins was who is a great uh, student. He had the time and energy to to follow this because, in a sense, we decided to put this on a on a on a proper framework. And the proper framework, at least the, um, according to us, is that if you have the orbital motion, and this orbital motion is living in a kind of a fluctuating background, which is random. How do you describe this? Well, you describe it with a Langevin equation, right? You have a binary system, but the binary system has some extra force, which is acting on it and has some um, properties. So the idea is that those parameters, you treat them as random. And their distribution as a function of time is going to satisfy what is called a Fokker plan equation. So in principle, you start with a delta function. So the period is like a determinist, tool, but as you, as you evolve with time, his distribution is going to be modified in a in a deterministic way. Well, well yeah, the, the distribution is telling you uh, the statistical properties, but you can compute how it evolves. And this is what a Fokker Planck equation uh, gives you once you know how each parameter evolves as a as a function of the gravity waves. Uh, you can, as I said, um, calculate how the distribution changes according to this Fokker Planck equation. So there are two different sets of um, coefficients. One of them are called drift coefficients. And those are the ones that you start, let's say, with a Gaussian distribution, they, they shift the distributions. Those are similar to what happens with deterministic effects, right? That you started with a eccentricity that is whatever, or some perihelium, and then because of deterministic effects, they are shifted. But also, you started with a very um, narrow distribution. There are also diffusion coefficients, so diffusion distribution by the fact that you in this uh, in this random motion that eventually also broadens your distribution. So in principle, if you have enough data points, you can also track how, as a function of time, how the distribution of data uh, evolves with time. This is also similar to what you do when you when you when you have a noise a noise um, source for these guys, it, and this is what people do, for instance, when when they want to know the orbit of the moon. Uh, with enough precision, they have their model, they have the noise, and the noise has also this kind of shape, so they, they can tell you how big these uh, guys are when you have the time series of data. Right? So in principle, this is an extra 
the kind of noise right to the orbits with certain statistical properties and you can compute them so that's the great thing that in principle the given the Langevin equation you can compute both the drift and the diffusion coefficient they are as i said uh, depending on the uh, value of the energy density or this uh, relative quantity at the level at, i mean evaluated at uh, resonance right and right once you have them you can then see how the how is the orbit uh, evolving with time as i said we use uh, the best systems that uh, we knew about for orbital motion tracking uh, one of them is the binary pulsars so binary pulsars as, as you know have these uh, radio waves uh, and the spins so I, I forgot to put the video so this is just the the image but in the web page of Michael Kramer you can find the the animation is a bit uh, old like the old dune so it's <laughs> But uh, still, it's nice that uh, these radio waves rotate, and as they rotate, some from I mean, every period they point towards you, and you can study this. Um, I mean, how these radio waves uh, come, and from this you can understand very well the acceleration of the other system and how it is, how this binary system is orbiting in time, and this has an amazing accuracy. In particular, nowadays they have a double pulsar which is beating all the records of accuracy but uh, even the Hulse Taylor is uh, you know it's a great it's a great great uh, pulsar each pulsar each binary has a one period right so in principle as, as I'm going to show you it's going to be uh, eating up different uh, places of parameter space the other uh, uh, system which also have uh, periods in the yeah in this in the region of interest are satellites artificial satellites and the moon itself so there are uh, some um, mirrors placed by the apollo mission in the moon and there has been a tracking of the moon since the 70s or maybe late 60s i guess 70s yeah so the um, of course the, the tracking is not always precise so it's not that at each particular time you know where the moon is with centimeter but on average as i say when you do the modeling you have your model which is deterministic with certain parameters what's going on and then they can tell you what given this model the uh, the the accuracy on the distance on the parameter distance if you want to the moon is at the level of centimeter all right so this is the achievement of course not now but on average so uh, when you take all the data uh, the parameter uh, the distance to the moon is is known to this level Right. Once you put all this in the in the well, you put all these ingredients in the at least first. What we have done is precisely take this order of magnitude of of the error. So we haven't done yet data analysis yet. We are trying to start this, but it's not easy. So what you they give us the 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 error in the in the measurement of this, and uh, you put on top of it the fact that there is an extra source of noise if you want, which is the the one coming from the gravity wave background you can derive uh, some constraints even today which fill this gap re this, uh, reasonably well so this red curve is a collection of pulsars that's why it's very wide so different pulsars you have different frequencies and on each frequency you can resonate with different modes so in principle you have a kind of envelope so the moon is this blue line here and uh, the satellite which has which has much shorter period is almost touching at these frequencies the ineffective but remember that now we don't have anything here so this is 2034 so already i think that well even by eye you see that uh, you you make a envelope all this region of parameters is is achieved today with these observations it may i mean we have to <laughs> There may be something we are not taking into account, but in principle, you take what they give you. This is the, you know, the error we have. You put on top of it the extra source of error, and that's kind of, in principle, that's it. Uh, if you do what these guys in PTA did with pulsars, but now with this other, because you see here, what they do in PTA is really signals in between, but the kind of measurements are the same as the one we use here. So those are pulsars. So if you take their prospects and you put them in the binary systems so you are gonna uh, start being very competitive for the moon 
there is a nice, uh, you know proposal of back to the moon play <laughs> the mirrors and then achieving a, a millimeter um, or below millimeter sensitivity for other reasons of course not to detect gravity waves, to maybe know more about geodesy how the moon i mean things about the moon or whatever and that would bring you uh, this low and also for satellites there's a whole campaign of better track satellites again for geodesy or other reasons and you see that eventually we may be in 2034 already having a great um, new parameter space explored with this with this idea okay so i think that's that's great now uh, we say about this uh, region in terms of physics so what are the signals by the way there are other futuristic uh, ideas which are great that can <laughs> go all over i mean wherever you want basically, because they are futuristic there is one by by the stanford uh, job hawkins group trying to put uh, they, they they want to see if you put uh, atomic clocks in asteroids again you when you start playing with asteroids you, you start reaching between pta and lisa so you very well asteroids you may also reach this area and they have incredible sensitivity curves there is also another mission called muares which is like a lisa on asteroids and uh, asteroids not asteroids <laughs> not lisa on asteroids whatever uh, and also you, you can reach much better but those are i would say more futuristic here i think they're playing with, with more realistic setups but anyway those are yeah So there's there's also um, astrometry to with so Gaia yeah. with Gaia or with I mean sure. you have SKA on the plot so they also are looking in the same yeah regime, right? yeah absolutely this is uh, for some reason it's not in this plot but you're right we mentioned it on the paper but I didn't put it on the because it wasn't clear for us the time scale maybe you you know but I I think there's already a limit and it's I think it's about ten to the minus three if I recall correctly right. on a partial data set. And yeah. they, they do project beating but with just Gaia with the data on tape, the, the, C, the CMB yeah, sure. bound. I thought about, the, uh, I had this in mind, uh, before, I mean, just before the talk, but then I, yeah, true, absolutely. We mentioned them in the paper, but that's true. Anyways, it's great. The, the most, uh, the most uh, detector we had, the better also, because as usual is with these guys, what is really challenging is to, to make sure that you are detecting it. Yeah, some extra systematics, right? So, uh, as was asked yesterday, or about how do you know that this is a detector? Okay, for now, constraints are easy. Detection harder. Okay, so which are the? So I think we did in the paper that I think it was a good, uh, in, in the end, a good idea was to uh, which are the signals that we could uh, be uh, sensitive to and PTA and lisa be uh, missing so, so what you want is something that peaks in the uh, micro uh, yeah, move uh, microhertz band so one of the best uh, candidate is uh, first order phase transitions in, and people are playing nowadays a lot with first order phase transitions because they want to uh, build or whatever or well, yeah, build signals for lisa but many of their models, if you play with parameters, can also do something like this. They can really reach a uh, microhertz uh, frequencies that, you know, don't. Um, I mean, uh, if you have a transition, for instance, I think it's uh, around 100 GB with some parameters, then uh, it's something that you would not be able to see with Lisa, but it's going to pick in this range. There is the nanograph uh, signal that uh, so far has some has been detected around here. It's not very clear what it is. Uh, the spectrum is compatible with uh, something like crazy that goes up like this, something that goes down. If it is supermassive black holes, it should go up like this. Uh, we may see it with the, you know, with the, with the moon in some years. So I think that's great. Uh, but today we really need to be a, a bit crazy to, to, <laughs> to make this go up. Still some people claim that some models do this. So, it's, you know, you have to, I mean, it's not my it's not my business, but uh, still, the, the great I think the, the the summary is that there are ways in which with our methods or even with Gaia or whatever, you you may be able to to say something about nanograph signals. So that would be a great confirmation or disproof, disproval. 
There is something called um, uh, supermassive black hole mimickers. I have no idea <laughs> what they are. It's one of these cross structure where uh, you don't have a real black hole, but something close to a black hole by Cardoso et al. And they claim they, they peak here, but the peak is not so so uh, narrow. And in principle, if they exist, the, the um, um, stochastic background would be more broadband. And something that is close to the heart to many people here is the ultralight bosons that depending on the mass of the candidate, they may be peaking at different frequencies. Lisa is great for this. Unfortunately, we are not so great. I guess the, the other uh, micro, micro health uh, campaigns, if they happen, they would be great to, to, to the lowest part of the... So, but the clear target in any case, is this uh, cosmology, cosmological phase transitions, which is it's a kind of hot topic uh, because of Lisa capabilities, I think. And they are summarized by some temperature, some strength of the transition, some rate of the nucleation of the bubbles, and the velocity of the bubbles as they expand. So those are, after you do all these simulations, it turns out that apparently these four parameters are the, the main ones. And uh, you can uh, understand or feel the peak frequency lies. And as I say, for values of these guys, which are kind of okay, okay, which are realistic, they may be peaking around these frequencies, okay? And that's why, uh, you know, we have to find ways to, to go into there, okay? So I think that there's a kind of bias in the community because Lisa is there. Well, it's, a, it's like the thing that happened with LHC. So let's try to build models that can be uh, can be seen in the near future. But uh, according to what I read in the papers, those it's totally normal that they could be also more to the left or more to the right. I don't know if someone who is more expert to comment on that, but that's my impression. More to the right is a bit hard, I think. You know, getting things closer to LIGO, but okay. First or the first transition in the in the early universe. Uh, what we did is a kind of precisely we did a parameter scan of what we can do with this, uh, for instance, with the lunar laser laser ranging or the satellites or the yeah yeah okay with with these two with these two trackers as compared to other um, observations in the future. And those are the parameters of the phase transition, right? Beta, temperature. And you see a place where there is blue and nothing else, that's where we can, or blue or green and nothing else, that's where we can reach and no one else can reach. If it is covered by LISA, it's going to be complementary to LISA, right? It's very hard to beat LISA. But, uh, you know, still, I mean, it's not a huge parameter space what we win, but, you know, certainly we are. And the reason is that. Even though by eye you could say, "Oh, yeah, I can fit a curve here." If you take a real moment, a real model, there are not so many models that fit exactly here. <laughs> so, well, who, you change parameters, but at least with the parameters we we play with, uh, yeah. But anyway, we do this already before Lisa flies, and I think it's a great, great uh, case thing. So I think that's all for for this uh, uh, first part, which is not the first part; it's most of the talk. But uh, shall, shall we stop here or I... I, I propose we take questions on this part and yeah. let, let's see how, how long it goes. But so, thank you for thank you. first talk. So questions. Uh, thank you, it was a great idea. Uh, how can you improve the sensitivity uh, with the, the moon by using better laser or better mirror, for instance? How do you increase by better laser, you mean? But now, uh, I, I know that the, the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, so maybe they want to increase the frequency or have more frequency bands to kind of get rid of the, of the noise there, but I, I don't really know. To be honest. I know that the, they want to reach the millimeter challenge, uh, for this, they need to go back to the moon. Not possible to do it with the mirrors. That, so maybe we can convince uh, Bethos to do it.
I was wondering if you have uh, tree, tree body systems and you have like all kinds of fancy resonances like the Kazine process or something, could you disturb this kind of resonances with having like this yeah. stochastic we background? Don't, I, just... I don't know. What? The idea is that you're gonna But like, for instance, how the fluctuations on dark matter affect the Kuiper belt. So this is the, the same, the same idea. That yeah, okay. heating Thanks. up systems with gravity waves. Yeah, thank you. So there was another. Yeah. So, but how close to do you have to be to have this effect? How what? How close uh, do you have to be to resonance? How close to resonance? Yes. You don't, you, don't really, you don't really care in the case of super stochastic background because you are always going to have a, a reservoir of all frequencies. Yes, but then you you, you pay the price uh, of the you know, just a small bandwidth that will. Uh... No, no, but you have all the waves coming to you, so who cares? But it's true I, that we want to. I use understand it. It, that you have an effect only if you are on resonance. Otherwise, that's uh, sure. But they have a, res a reservoir of all frequencies. The stochastic gravity wave, the stochastic background has all frequencies coming to you. I understand, but okay, it will be all you know a logarithmic scale for gravity wave from for phase transition. Okay, we have not. Completed. I'm just wondering because it seems it's, incredible, okay, that you, you can really displace the moon by one centimeter, yeah, yeah. No, in one year, okay, or so. No, no, in one year, no, in thirty years. In thirty years, okay, in thirty years. Yeah. Uh, okay. As I said, there is a reservoir. We have to do the calculation you want to do, but it could be more for, for a, let's say, a supermassive black hole orbiting. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, this may be out of resonance very fast. Okay. Okay. I agree. I agree. That's harder. We did it for the ultralight dark matter with Sergei. Yeah. But then there, the ultralight dark matter, really, you have most of the time you are only one frequency. Um, how do you? estimate the future sensitivity in dashed blue for the measurement of the distance to the moon? This one? Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We, we, we assume it's one millimeter and with one millimeter. cadence. Wow. Okay. The cadence of observation that they tell you. One millimeter, one millimeter the precision of the distance bet yeah, between Earth and moon. To assume that there is a campaign of observation of, I don't know, 30 more years. No, well, not 30 because we, maybe 15 more years with this kind of sensitivity. And for the solid blue, which uh, precision did you say? Blue is the, the centimeter one that we assume that has been there for since Apollo. One centimeter. Sorry? One centimeter. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Indeed, we are a bit, uh, there, there was a change in the, uh, in the ranging of the moon in the, in the 80s and we only take 28, so it could be a bit better because we don't take the previous one, but <laughs> we need, I mean, to do it properly, we need to start playing with their, with their software. Other questions or comments? I don't see any, so I may ask you how long is the second talk? It's fine, I just want to give the idea. Sorry? I just will present the idea. You can present the idea. I can present the idea and then we can either discuss it or... Yeah, because we have like, another option is we put it in tomorrow morning, like say 12.30 and we have a bit more time. No, I think it's fine. It's fine, okay, then please go ahead. Yeah. How much time do I have? Like five to five. ten, but say five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> dynamical friction is fine. Now, the is the idea that if I'm moving in a medium and I'm interacting with it through gravity to, with all these particles, I am attracting them to me. And as I move, I am also leaving them behind. So they are accumulating behind me. As they accumulate behind me, there is an overdensity. So the medium is on average pulling from me, but there is an overdensity behind me. So they are, this is pulling back and there is a G, G square order effect that is breaking my motion. Okay. So now, of course, this is proportional to the velocity because if the velocity is zero, there's no, I mean, you just, you are homogeneously attracted by everyone. So there's no force. It depends a bit on the properties of the medium. If the medium is very hot, I mean, it's moving around all the time. So it's not gonna be uh, important. So it's important in a cold medium and you are moving with certain velocity with respect to it. 
where do we use this in, in, in dark matter studies? Well, let's take, for instance, this for next, by the way, these transparencies are by most of them. So uh, this uh, Fornax is a, well, this is a picture. It's a dwarf galaxy and it has, this is kind of the center of, of, the, of the luminous, well, of most of the luminous things you see from them. And there are globular clusters around, okay, at a certain distance. So more in detail, Fornax is like one kiloparsec and it has like 10 to the seven solar masses, right? Is the mass is dark matter dominated? It has five or six, well, depends how you count, globular clusters. And if they are small in mass as compared to a dark matter halo, two of them are, or I mean, if you compute the, the effect of this friction as a, as a function of time, they should have already fallen down to the center. How you have the break in, it gives you a time scale. Okay, because there is some kind of friction. And when you do it naively, all right, you find that for global clusters three and four, the, they live at very short radius where there is like high density and you expect them to have a time scale of falling to the center, which is less than one giga year, okay? Now you would say, well, maybe they are new stuff that formed around. Well, if you study their stellar structure, it's kind of old, so, in principle, if they are there, it's because they have, I mean, they, they were born somewhere and they have eventually end up there. This is the max problem. Is it a problem? Well, maybe it's initial conditions, right? So because it, maybe this tune is not, this is that the dark matter is smaller uh, for different reasons, okay? What we did, is we took uh, three possibilities. One of them is self-interacting dark matter. And what the self-interacting dark matter is gonna do is gonna generate a core of dark matter, which is more coherent, okay? So the, the dispersion of the, of the dark matter is gonna be smaller. And then this modifies the dynamical friction. We consider also a Fermi gas. And the idea is that if you start putting uh, a lot of fermions together uh, uh, in phase space, uh, you know, the galaxy has some size, but also some size in momentum. So you cannot put, uh, you know, the velocity is also constrained to be below the velocity. So at some point, it starts to be degenerate. And if you move in a degenerate, degenerate medium, where you, you make collapse, the same is, and that was the inspiration was that the same was considered for ultralight dark matter, where if you scatter gravitationally with a medium, which is a wave, you are, you need to put things, I mean, compact, compactify things, compactify, well, make things more compact than the, the blurry wavelength, uh, it's hard, right? So the idea was whether with these guys, the dynamical friction may be alleviated, okay? And I'm gonna leave it here, I think, because, well, what we concluded is that it may be, yeah, let me just give you the, 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 the final plot. So here we computed the time scale for the different uh, globular clusters. This is three, this is four, as a function of dark matter model. And in principle with the standard Navarro frame white, they have this small short case, but with self-interacting dark matter or with the generator matter, they, this can go up all the way to what you expect. Okay? Just to finish, for the self-interacting dark matter, you are within constraints. For the degenerate dark matter, you are in trouble with. So it's a bit uh, a pity. That's it. Okay. okay thank, thank you very much. You. <laughs> Is there any quick question? We can discuss more tomorrow. No, okay, if not, uh, we thank Diego then for the two talks. <laughs> thank you. And in 10 minutes, we will have the GIT break by Savas Dimopoulos for, ah, I didn't ask if there are questions from Zoom, sorry. Anyway, for the people on Zoom, the link for the GIT break will not be the same. So I just send an email now to all of you so that you can connect on the, on the talk in 10 minutes. Thanks again.
Thank you.